Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another VES Artex Academy webinar. Today, we're talking to Dr. Kevin Harvestine from Penn State, and we're talking about managing seasonal and daily rhythms to maximize milk components. Throughout the presentation, you can ask questions through the question and answer section at the bottom of your screen or through the chat feature as well. We'll be answering questions towards the end of the presentation. And if we don't get to your question, what we'll do is we'll ask Dr. Harvatine if he can follow up with you afterwards. I will pass the floor over to Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's great, great to be here to talk about seasonal rhythms and, and it's a very good timing because we're, we're right kind of at the switch of our rhythms that we're gonna be talking about and, and things should be, at least components are, are, should be on the upswing uh, in the coming, coming months. So I have a poll question to start us off here. So the poll question is, do you see consistent changes in milk component components across the year on your farm or farms? We'll just give people a, a moment to answer. And right now you've got 87% of people who are saying yes. It, great. That, that's what I think we we really expect is that um, when we talk to people, this this is something that we live every year, right? That milk composition is um, changing a changing across the year. And we started looking into this a couple of years ago. And um, you know, at that point, I think everybody really blamed this on on heat stress. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about heat stress today, also. And and I want to come out right out front and say. That I'm not saying that heat stress is not important. Heat stress is very important. It's just that the seasonal rhythm is something separate from heat stress. So, so we've done quite a bit of work to characterize this seasonal rhythm. Um, and and we'll, we'll show you that data here today. So the first thing I always like to, to talk about is, is what should we be keeping our eye on as far as, as milk, milk value? And in most of our milk markets in the US, we're in a component-based pricing system and we're being paid for fat and protein yield. And the way I look, like to look at this is to look at your cash flow. So this is calculating dollars that are coming from fat, protein, and other solids for a cow that's making 85 pounds per day of a 3.9 fat, 3.1 protein. And you can see it's bounced around over, over time, but um, most of our value is in fat and protein. Uh, fat has increased in value over the past 10 years until the past past year. Protein has been much more, much more variable. The good news is that we can have both fat and protein, right? So we don't have to argue about if we wanna make fat or protein, we, we, we can get, get both. The other solids, which is the lactose and um, the minerals, you're actually probably paying more to ship those uh, at, at some times uh, in the market than what you're actually getting paid for them. So our focus really needs to be on pounds of fat and pounds of protein that we're shipping because that's what we're, what we're being paid for. So with that in mind, we wanna kind of step back and think about what is impacting milk, fat, and protein yield. And I'm, I'm a nutritionist, so I kind of look at the world as nutritional factors and then everything else, right? On the nutrition side, we have a lot of things that impact fat and protein. So on milk fat, we have diet-induced milk fat depression where we decrease milk fat by having a diet that's too high in unsaturated fat, too fermentable, diets that cause acidosis because of slug feeding or slug eating, a lot of different things that go into that, that problem. We can also increase milk fat by providing additional substrate that the cow needs to make milk fat. So that would be acetate coming from forages. Acetate's what a main thing that she needs to build those fatty acids from scratch in the mammary gland. And then we can also provide fat to 
and our fat supplements that are important to providing what we call that preformed fat that goes in, in the milk fat. On the protein side, we really think about two things. One is amino acid supply because that's the building blocks that the mammary gland needs to make milk protein. So we think about microbial protein synthesis, that, that the protein that's made in the rumen, and then our amino acid balancing coming in from our, our amino acid supplements. The other part is starch uh, and, and energy supply has an impact on what regulation is going on in, in the mammary gland. So these non-nutritional factors, I used to joke that these were the things that I didn't care about because I, I was a nutritionist, uh, but over the last couple of years, become much more interested in these non-nutritional factors. So we have things like genetics. I'm gonna show you just a, a, a little bit of genetic data today time of day, stage lactation parity. But the big thing we're gonna talk about today is this seasonal pattern uh, in seasonal regulation. We're also gonna link in talking about heat stress because heat stress does have really big impact on the cow and how much milk she's, she's producing. So very briefly, we wanna talk about what are these rhythms? So the rhythms are just repeating cycles that are driven by timekeeping mechanisms in the animal. And they can be reset or entrained by external factors. An example of that would be the timing of lighting. So what we mean is that this animal is actually keeping track of what time of day it is and what time of year it is. And that is clock is running so that the cow doesn't need a calendar to know that it's July and doesn't need a calendar to know that we're moving towards August, right? Uh, it's keeping track of that timing in, in its brain. So we have seasonal rhythms that occur over the year, but we would also have daily rhythms that occur over the day. And you probably, probably appreciate those daily rhythms much more that there's a time of day that you're more alert there's a time of day that you are hungry, right? And then there's a time of day where you're not as alert, you get sleepy, you don't wanna eat so much, right? So, so really some similar basic mechanisms keeping track of what time it is, uh, and this is occurring in, in the brain. So they keep cycling, even if an animal's put under constant conditions. Uh, so in daily patterns, if, if you locked yourself in a basement with no lighting, uh, no clocks, and, and no, nothing to tell you what time of day it was, you would get tired tonight, you would go to sleep, you'd wake up maybe 20 minutes later than you did this morning, you would have a normal day and your days would actually just get longer by 20 minutes because they're natural rhythms a little bit over 24 hours. But you would keep that going for a considerable period of time. Same thing with these seasonal patterns. They're gonna keep running until they get reset. And why do we have these? Well, they're helpful to allow the animal to prepare to upcoming changes before they occur. So this is part of, part, part of uh, like the Boy Scout model of always being prepared, right? So that cow knows that it's becoming summer and it's going to adapt before it's summer, right? And then it's gonna start adapting before it's winter because you wouldn't want that cow just randomly not knowing what time of year it was and not being ready when the snow comes, right? It can't wait for the snow to start falling to, to prepare for that. You, it actually wants to be prepared ahead of time. So these are really uh, a big advantage to the animal. Uh, seasonal rhythms coordinate physiology with the weather and food availability. And there's some amazing examples in nature. So the birds know to fly north and they know to fly south, right? How do they know that? Well, it's the, time, it's the timing of the sun and they're sensing that in their brain in, in keeping track of what time it is. If, again, if you put those birds in a dark room, they will still keep that timing of migratory behavior. Uh, hibernation is another good example that that bear has to know that it's summer and I need to get fat to prepare because I'm going into that hibernation in the winter. Uh, another example in our small ruminants would be seasonal breeding in sheep uh, where they're, they're only going to breed during a certain time of year. And the advantage there is then all of the lambs come at a certain time of year and that's matched to when the environment and food availability is such that that lamb has the best chance for, for survival. Uh, you already mentioned there's these daily rhythms that coordinate physiology across changes in the day. Um, most processes follow these 24-hour cycles. 
including milk synthesis and intake. I won't talk so much about that, but that's another big area of our research program is thinking about the daily patterns of intake and the daily patterns of milk synthesis and how far management uh, modifies those. So again, this is to improve survival by anticipating changes and allowing adaptations before they occur. So if you think about way back before that cow was standing in a barn, she had to worry about predators. She also had to go and find her own food, right? Feed. So, so this, these rhythms allow uh, the animal to adapt to be uh, at the best chance of surviving in the environment. So we know photoperiod has a large impact on milk yield. And, and photoperiod is the term that we use for day length. Uh, so really cool data going all the way back to 1978. And this is a nice summary put together by Jeff Dahl a number of years ago, looking at all the experiments that looked at long days versus short days. And what they see is that with long days, 16 to 18 hours of light versus eight to 10 hours of light, you get five to 10% increase in milk yield with no change in milk composition. So you get increased fat yield, increased protein yield. Really nice, consistent response. And think about the profitability of that. Five to 10% increase in milk yield, you're gonna to have to feed them more to keep up to that, right? But you're not buying uh, a, a, a lot of other expensive stuff to do this, right? It's just managing the lighting. Uh, big, big, uh, potential there. And again, it's been really consistent in the literature. There's an additional effect of short days during the dry period. Uh, so really neat effect there that short days during the dry period appear to stimulate more memory development. So then when that cow calves, she actually has more milk synthesizing tissue to be able to produce more milk. And it was a, a, about a five to 10% increase in milk yield that was sustained quite far into that, that, that next lactation. What's interesting is these are eliminated by constant light. And what constant light does is it, it fails to entrain uh, these signals. So we focused in, in and I know we, we haven't talked about photoperiod very much um, it, that I have seen over the last couple of years, but this was really popular in early 2000s. There's a lot of articles about it. And back then a lot of the interest was looking at the lighting in the barn to make sure your lights were bright enough, right? Uh, because those lights were expensive and it was expensive to, to run them. So, so we're really worried about getting enough light. But the other part of this is you have to have darkness. And that darkness we're really starting to appreciate is, is really important. So we're, we're, we're into the camping season of the year and you might hear some radio shows that, that'll talk about research showing that camping is good for you. And what they can actually measure is that when people go out and camp in kind of wilderness camping situations where they're away from what we call light pollution, that that strengthens their daily rhythms and they can actually see improvements in immune function and insulin signaling and things like that from having that stronger daily rhythm. So part of our problem as humans right now is light pollution from our phones and, and, and all sorts of other things, right? But we also have a similar issue with cows that we are running the parlor 24 hours a day. So we have a hard time getting the lights off in the barn. Maybe we have floodlights out in the, 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 the barnyards or um, in the driveway and that light is shining into our barn. So we have to be really careful that we aren't disturbing setting these signals with, with, the, with the limiting the dark period. So we need both long days and, uh, and darkness at night. All right, so let's talk about these seasonal rhythms. So these are rhythms that repeat every year. They're mostly driven by day length. And on, on the right-hand side, I'm showing how these things change across the year for different states. And later on, I'm gonna show you DHIA data from we have Florida, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Texas. So, so day length varies across the year. It, it depends where you are in the country that the further north you go, the bigger variation you have across the year, right? So day length varies, but then also, you have this lengthening and shortening days that an animal can sense that today is longer or shorter than yesterday. And that is important to the rhythm. And then the other part is the change in day length. And the middle uh, uh, panel is showing that, that there's part of the year where the change from one day to the next is larger 
than at in other parts of the year. And the, the, the system's also able to sense that. So we have day length, absolute length, lengthening, shortening, and then if how much different are we from one day to the next? So these are regulated, seasonal rhythms are regulated through the same mechanisms as circadian rhythms in, in the brain. I uh, fully appreciate these things are hard to separate from temperature in the real world. And the bob bottom panel is showing uh, temperature, average temperature um, in these states across the year, right? So the data I'm gonna show today is real world data. Um, and it's a lot of it, it's huge amount of data, right? So it's great that we can make those robust, robust observations in the real world, but it's hard for us to exactly say that this is 100% a seasonal rhythm versus what impact heat stress is having. And again, I, I don't want to say there's not effective heat stress. There definitely is. It's just that these are separate things going on, these seasonal rhythms versus heat stress. So the so first way to look at this is at the milk market level. And what's kind of cool about this is this is all milk sold in on the Northeast milk market at the top and the central order at, at the bottom. So it's, this isn't statistics. This isn't eight cows at a university, right? This is all the milk sold in these, these milk markets. And, you could, and I always like to joke, can you see a, a, a pattern here, right? Uh, and, and it's pretty obvious. It's a clear repeating pattern. You fit a cosine function to this, it's you know, almost a perfect fit. We have highest milk fat and protein, January 1. Uh, lowest milk fat and protein July 1, repeating every year. Uh, so the first thing I always like to comment about heat stress is that, you know, we have heat stress differs between years, but this is a really consistent pattern. And this is the first thing that I like to think that shows that this is something different than heat stress, right? Um, and we see this through all of our milk marketing orders. So with fat, it's about 0.25 units from January to, to July. Milk protein also about 0.2 units. So this is our individual milk markets, milk fat at the top and milk protein at, at, at the bottom. And you see, we have a little bit of a difference between our milk markets. The pattern is has the same shape, right? But the, the amplitude or, or the difference between our highest and the lowest varies. So the further south we go, the less difference we have from January to July. We still have the pattern, but we have a less of a difference in milk fat percent. Further north you go, the bigger change we have across the year in milk, milk fat percent, but really consistent within, within US data. So now another poll question here, what should we expect in the Southern hemisphere? Same timing of the rhythm or opposite timing of the rhythm? just give people a few more seconds to answer. Right now you have 88% of people saying the opposite timing of the rhythm. Yeah, that, that's what I think is, is going to happen also, right? Uh, and I, I always get the question of, of do you have data from from near the equator, do you have data from the Southern hemisphere? And I'd love to have that, that data. It'd be really neat, neat to see it, right? I don't know where to go to get that data and data that wouldn't be really overly confounded because um, a, a, a lot of other countries, we would have more herds that are uh, grazing. Um, in the U.S. database, we, we are so highly TMR feeding and our diets are pretty much consistent across the year that we're able to uh, take out more of, the, more of that dietary effect than what we could if we look in these other regions. But, but I fully ex I hear anecdotally from other people that work in Southern Hemisphere that, yeah, they see the exact opposite in the Southern Hemisphere um, as what we see in the, the Northern Hemisphere. Um, Okay, uh, so so uh, the, you know the, the milk market data that we're showing here is milk fat percent, milk protein percent, and I I, I don't want to say it's not worth looking at percents. It is. It, it it it's one thing to look at, but in the end, you're being paid for pounds, right? So we want to move from percents to pounds. So we went and got a DHI database to do this. So what we have is data from 2003 to 2016. It's all herds 
Uh, so we have almost 10,000 herds in these four states. It's 760,000 um, uh, test day averages, right? So a, a lot of data. And what we see is that there is also a rhythm to milk yield across the year. But what's interesting is this rhythm is a little bit different than our milk fat and protein concentration. It's actually peaking later. So across these states, it's peaking sometime in, in April. So if you think about that's lagging a little bit from our, our spring equinox. Um, so, so it's not, it, it is a rhythm, it's a very strong rhythm, but the timing of the rhythm is different than the timing of the rhythm for, for fat and protein percent. So we went on to look at fat yield and, and uh, fat concentration in, in this database. Uh, let's look at fat concentration first on the left. So again, all exactly like we see in the milk markets that highest milk fat, this is called acrophase is your peak, highest milk fats occurring in early January, really close to January 1. It's kind of crazy when they do analysis, it comes up so close to that. Uh, so peak is January 1, lowest is July 1. Uh, milk fat yield is a combination of fat percent and milk yield, right? So since our milk yield is peaking in April, we get peak fat yield somewhere in February to March. It's kind of falling a little bit between the two. What's interesting is that the Minor Institute's also been uh, doing work in collaboration with Dave Barbano at Cornell, where they're using the same equipment that's used to uh, uh, measure fat and protein percent in our DHI samples and, and our payment labs, and they're able to predict categories of fatty acids. So the one category they're able to predict is this de novo synthesized fatty acids. So these are the fatty acids that are made in the mammary gland. And this is uh, uh, one creamery, and I think this is like 40 herds uh, in, in this co-op over 2014 to 2019. And you can see a uh, really pretty consistent pattern that there's this seasonal rhythm in those de novo fatty acids. So the blue line is de novos going to the left axis and the green line is fat concentration going to the, the right axis. Now these de novos don't explain 100% of the variation because these axis, the de novo line is zoomed in twice as much as the, the fat percent. But the rest of the variations explained by our mixed source, which are both de novo and, and preformed. So what it appears is that the capacity of the mammary gland to make milk fat changes across the year. And I think this is really logical to expect. If you think about that bear that has a seasonal pattern to getting fat going into winter, uh, that, that's clearly a seasonal rhythm, seasonal regulation of fat synthesis. And that's observed in a number of different animals. So I don't think it's, it's uh, so surprising to, to see that we have seasonal regulation of the ability to make fatty acids from scratch in, in the mammary gland. Uh, one thing I like to comment on is that you know, some people are using this for diagnostics within herds. And if you're doing that, you, you need to be changing your, your, your uh, goal across the year. So there's also an annual pattern to milk protein concentration and yield. Uh, so again, protein concentrations on the right, uh, lining up in, in late December, very close to that January one time. Uh, in our peak in milk protein yield, again, is coming in March. It's kind of halfway between that peak in protein concentration and peak in, in milk yield. We, we've also gone on to do um, some, some other work, and, and I have to recognize um, uh, Isaac Sulfur, who's now at the University of Minnesota, uh, led this work when he's a PhD student in my lab, and he's continued this on now, now in his own research program. And so this is some work that he, he was able to get a, uh, a database that um, had different breeds. And what we see is that this rhythm is, is conserved across all the breeds. But our higher fat breeds, we actually see a bigger change across the year. So if you think about this rhythm as being, you know, an X percent change in milk fat across the year, if you have higher milk fat, that ends up giving you a higher rhythm across the year. Uh, Isaac's gone on to do um, a number of other analyses. Uh, we see consistent responses between first, second, and third lactation animals. We can see consistent responses between some genotypes that are really important for milk fat potential. Uh, he also sees consistent rhythms in freestalls and open lots 
and consistent rhythms in two and three uh, time of day milk, 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 milking um, herds. Uh, a lot of this data was the database made available to them through Diamond V, and they've been uh, doing their seasonal milk composition, milk monitoring uh, for, for a number of years also. So question that we always get is, is this heat stress? And I think one important thing to ask is what does heat stress do to a cow? So this is a summary of what happens to milk yield and composition when you put cows in a heat chamber, turn up the temperature and cause pretty extreme heat stress. So in all these situations, they have a considerable drop in milk yield. So seven to 23 pounds per day, but actually milk fat percent went up and milk protein percent went down. So what's interesting is that's not what we see during the summer. We do see lower milk yield, but we also see lower milk fat and lower milk protein. So generally, um, it, that's not, not lining up. Um, the other thing we've done is in our modeling, we've looked at the annual rhythm versus looking at the average temperature. And what we find is that the annual rhythm actually fits the data better than temperature itself. The other thing that I'll say is that, that it's interesting that we uh, see the, the, the peak of milk yield is, is that end of March, early April, right? Lowest milk yield is actually in September and early October. So our lowest milk yield is not lining up with the peak of heat stress, right? So again, heat stress obviously from this can have a big effect. So we don't wanna forget about heat stress. It's just that heat stress is doing something separate from the seasonal rhythms. We have to think about both. So what do I think is going on? I think there's two, what we call seasonal timekeepers. So this is two spots in the brain that are keeping track of what time of year it is. It's doing something different for milk composition. Uh, and they, that timekeeper is driven by lengthening and shortening days and aligns with that solstice. Milk yield is driven by the rate of change in day length and seems to align with that equinox. That, that's what I think is going on. Um, Constant long days appears to be setting the physiology of the spring equinox, increased milk yield and no change in composition. And this really confused us for a long time uh, because that long days experimentally is getting higher milk yield, but summer when we have our long days, we're actually getting lower milk yield, right? So how, how do we put those two together? Well, there's this concept called photorefractoriness that's been uh, well characterized in a number of experimental animals. And what it is, is that if you put an animal under constant conditions, which is what they do in long photo period work, is it's constant 16 hour days, the over a couple of weeks, the animal will actually switch from rather than doing what it normally does under long, um, long days, it'll actually switch and revert to the opposite phenotype. So what it looks like is that constant long days causes an animal to always think it's in the spring. And in the spring, you have higher milk yield, average or milk composition, right? So we have higher milk fat and protein yield, which is a good phenotype for us, right? Because that's where we would get um, maximal milk fat and protein protein yield. Uh, we can't experimentally demonstrate this, or at least we, we have not yet experimentally demonstrated this. This would be really hard to, to demonstrate under super controlled conditions. Uh, but this is what the biology uh, would fit to, to explain the observations that are out in the field. So a poll question here, do you have a set goal for milk yield or for, for milk yield and composition that you have discussed with your consulting team. And I'm, I'm actually really, really curious about this answer to this poll. Just give a few more seconds for people to answer. Right now you've got 79% of people who are saying yes. That's, that's great because so what, what, I, what I often think is that people don't have a, a set goal in mind, they just want more, right? Uh, which I'm not gonna say that's, that's bad, right? Or we're, 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 we're always on this trajectory of, of wanting to get better and better. But if we, if we don't set a goal, we, we don't know if we're doing good or good or bad. So the follow up of that is, do you change your goal for milk yield and composition across the year? 
Yes, no, or not officially. We'll just give a few more seconds. Right now you have 59% of people who are saying yes. That's that's great. And in this, let's go um, it, it to our next slide to discuss this. So what, what I often hear about is that all summer nutritionists are getting hit over the head with the baseball bat saying, you're screwing something up. I don't have the fat and protein that I had in January, right? Well, you, you probably shouldn't based on this seasonal rhythm, right? So I wanna go through a series of things of what I think we can do to help with this seasonal rhythm. And the first thing I, I want, I, I think would be really important to do is to accurately and precisely change your goals across the year. So 0.25 units of fat, 0.2 units of protein. Uh, and what's really important about this is that, that I think part of that year, so in my figure at the bottom, putting in what you expect that rhythm to look like, right? Uh, now, if you have a constant goal, which is that line, part of the year, you would think you have a problem when you don't, right? And now you're chasing ghosts. You might be spending money in that diet trying to recover milk fat that, that you didn't really lose, right? Now, on the other side of it, in January, you might think, oh, geez, I'm doing good. Well, you, you, maybe you should be doing better, right? So same, uh, really big problems in both of those cases. If we need to change our goal across the year so we can accurately and precisely know if we're doing what we should be doing, if we're meeting our potential, right? Uh, so really important. First, first thing is to expect this to happen um, and kind of take a little bit of the emotion out of it to know that, oh, we, we, you know, we came down, it's July 1. Now we should expect to be going back up. The other thing to comment on is that over time, you have to change your goal too, right? So this is average milk fat and protein um, over the last 20 years in the Northeast and upper Midwest milk market. And you can see over the last 10 years, we've moved from an average milk fat at 3.7 to an average milk fat around 3.9, right? So first thing there is if you have the same goal as 10 years ago, it's time to update that, right? And, and those are kind of hard things to move in your mind because you kind of get set in, in expecting a certain thing. We've been on a constant increase in milk protein over that time period. Part of this is our genetic potential. So this is data coming from Center for Dairy Cattle Breeding, looking at the genetic potential based on birth year. Um, milk fat percent on the top milk fat pounds on the bottom. So for many years, 1980 to 2000, we were gaining fat yield based on breeding for milk yield, right? Since then, we've still been gaining fat yield, but we've been doing it more by breeding for milk fat percent. So just over the past 10 years, genetic potential has increased 0.17 units um, for, for milk fat. So again, just, just want you to be changing your goals, not just over the season, but year, year to year. Next thing is we do not have an experimentally valid, validated way to manage out of seasonal rhythms, but I think a constant long day photo period's best recommendation for lactating cows for now, but remember you need that dark phase. Think about short day lighting for dry cows, at least for the short days of the year. So during the winter, the easy thing to do is to turn the darn lights off at night, right? During the summer, if we have an open barn, it's hard to block light out. Can be done, but that's harder to do to block light out. But but let's not let's not have light pollution and have those lights on constantly and ruin that effect during the winter. It is possible if you have good light control, you could cycle cows faster through the low yield season. Um, they do this a little bit in poultry, where you can change days, change lighting by half hour per day and you can cycle through that low part of the year and then go slower through the, the better part of the year. I, I don't think, we, we probably have very few farms that would have the control to be able to do that today. Uh, 
it, it is biologically possible to do that, but, but I, I think it would be rather, rather difficult. Um, poll question is here. Uh, do you, uh, wrong, wrong questions pop, popping up. Um, so is, is your barn consistently currently dark for four or more hours each day? Uh, you, My you apologies, up. I don't have nope. that one up. Nope, nope, no problem. Uh, but I think it's a good, good question to think about, right? And I know we're trying to maximize our parlor. Um, you know, may, maybe you can't do it for the whole farm, but depending on your barn layout, if you can get those lights out and block out light pollution for four hours a day, that there's milk to be had there, right? Again, really consistent five to 10% increase in, in milk yield. I, I think we give that up on a lot of our, our farms because we, we have a hard time managing that. Next thing is remember the capacity for milk fat and especially de novo synthesis is highest in January, might be a good time of year to feed your digestible fiber. Uh, so good forages, if you have BMR corn silage to feed, high digestibility and non forage fiber. Uh, you know, I also think these are good things to feed during the summer and some people feed them there trying to uh, take away some of those effects of heat stress. But if the mammary gland doesn't have the capacity to make more milk fat, it might not be the best time to take advantage of those if you can't feed them year round. I don't have data for it, but I, I think it's something to think about on how you might be able to take advantage there. Uh, make sure you're not hurting peak production in the spring. So make sure you're providing enough feed as cows are making more, more milk. They're going to uh, they're, they're going to have to be um, uh, eating more, right? So make sure that they don't run faster than you are uh, adjusting your, your intakes. Overcrowding, you know, if there's a time of year where you don't want to be overcrowded would be in that spring when that cow has the potential to make more yield, right? She has the, the, the physiological capacity to do it. If you're overcrowded, you're going to cut that off. Uh, account for energy needed when outside of the thermal neutral zone. So if it's too hot or too cold, something I think we can think about in our ration balancing programs. This is changing the protein to energy ratio. Um, we can watch our months to track uh, that, that, that depending on how extreme our, our temperature conditions are there. I don't know that we're always thinking about this when we're doing our ration balancing. It's part of that maintenance requirement that, that we might wanna be adjusting. Manage to reduce the additional effect of heat stress during summer. Again, heat stress is bad. Uh, we don't want to add that on top of the seasonal rhythm because then we're going to see more of an impact. So cow cooling, silages, and feed stability, you know, both at the silage face and in the feed bunk, especially if it's in the sun. Uh, higher fat diets, you know, there's, there's uh, a long tradition of this and the idea is that there's less heat of fermentation. And when cows drop off an intake, we've increased the energy density of that diet. Uh, you know, what's a little bit interesting there is that in Lance Bumpgard's work with heat stress cows, they actually prefer to burn glucose rather than fat during that time period. But I think there's still these advantages to thinking about adjusting fat levels in your diet. It appears cows would make equal use of that fat for milk fat synthesis across the year because the seasonal rhythm, again, is more in that de novo than the preformed fatty acid. So some people feed more palmitic acid during the summer, trying to make up for some of that lost milk fat. Watch feeding behavior during the summer, probably more slug feeding during heat stress, increased risk for diet induced milk fat depression. I don't like night feeding. Um, I like the idea of getting feed out earlier in the morning as a better way. Basically cows get tired and they wanna rest and relax at night, right? And it's hard to get, keep them up and eating. And I just wanted to quickly show some data we have on that. So this is an experiment where we fed cows once per day in the morning in the red line, uh, once per day in the evening in the blue or 50-50 a.m. p.m. And we have a feed observation system so we can look at feed intake across the day. And I just wanna point out that when we fed at 8 p.m., both the PM and the 50-50 the fed cows ate 50% more in the two hours after feeding than they did when they were fed in the morning. 
<clears throat> and then they go to bed and they don't eat any different during the overnight and they wait till the afternoon period. So what we see is that what we uh, is that the cows eat when they get fresh feed and they eat in that afternoon period. So if you look at grazing cows, they tend to, to eat later in the day. Photosynthesis has been running and sugar and amino acid concentrations are higher in that forage, right? So there's, there's a reason that there would be an advantage for a grazing cow there. So when we feed at night, that cow is kind of hungry and she wants to go to bed, right? So she binges and then, then goes to bed. We did this experiment in March. We came back and repeated it in August. Um, and saw the same, same exact thing. So I really worry about night feeding. We have to give that cow some time to rest. What I would rather do is to get up early, you know, get some feed in that cow, maybe five in the morning, um, not two in the morning, that's too early. She needs to rest, but get her up, get some feed in her before the heat of the day comes. So fixing seasonal management issues, corn silage, you know, try, try to have enough carryover. So some people run into this seasonal pattern on their farm because they're feeding green corn silage for part of the year, right? Um, you have to factor in that increased fermentability as the feed stored, uh, maintain herd days and milk through good repro programs. There's some seasonality to fertility, plus you have that negative effect of heat stress on fertility. So you want to manage that well, or you're gonna make another seasonal rhythm in your herd, right? Uh, seasonal pattern and colostrum synthesis appears to also happen with lowest yield in the fall. Uh, make sure you're stockpiled to, to have that. Uh, short day lighting during the dry period might help. Uh, I have no data on that, but since it increases milk yield, I, I uh, think it would be interesting to see if it would increase colostrum synthesis uh, also. I, I don't think it would hurt. I uh, just want to, to quickly talk again about this pattern of feeding across the day. So this is grazing cows, but on top is eating and the bottom's ruminating. And just kind of wanted to wrap up with the idea that, that it's not just eating, but it's also ruminating and that cow's resting and ruminating at night and we have to uh, be conscious of those, those rhythms. This rhythm seems to hold in heat stress also. There's some data with high heat stress where cows are still ruminating during the night. Okay, our take home principles. There's a seasonal rhythm of milk yield, so we need to change our goals across the year. The rhythm varies by region, but it's also highly conserved. Right now, we do not know how to eliminate the rhythm, but we should try to not make it worse, right? Uh, so again, by, by not managing heat stress, not managing our forage inventories, um, not managing reproduction well across the year, we can add additional problems in. But these are really kind of separate, all separate issues. Heat stress is that additional problem that we need to manage, but be careful with, with night feeding. Um, what I always like to say there is watch the cows. I think there's a lot of interactions on farms. It's gonna depend on milking times and feeding times and, and how things are running in that environment. Uh, but but I, I, I really warn against uh, feeding late at night. I think you wanna watch the cows and see, see how they respond to that. I uh, need to recognize the folks in the lab that, that do the hard work. So our current and, and past lab members Again, a lot of this seasonal work was done by, by Isaac Sulfur. Uh, we've also been supported by a number of, of USDA grants and also um, uh, grants and contracts from both industry sponsors and, and commodity boards. Thank you for, for your time and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one is when you're talking about dark, is that totally dark, no light at all, or low level light? Yeah, so um, there, there's a difference in wavelength of light too. So blue light is the worst. Uh, well, it, blue light would be the best during the day, the worst at night, right? Red light would be the best at, at night. So, um, I, I don't know the measurements, but there would be some some benchmarks out there saying uh, how much how much light would be be too much. Um, I, I I know you, you kind of have to with work within some practical limitations. 
So you would want to have definitely low light. If you need some lights on in the area, if you can switch over to red lights would be, dim red lights would be the, the, the best alternative. Thank you. Uh, so for how many days or months would you recommend to have carryover for BMR corn silage? Uh, is that three months? Is that enough or would you prefer more? That's that's a great question. I'm I'm not a, a corn silage expert, so I I um, I, I I don't want to throw out too much of a guess because I know there would be people out there that would be um, much better at answering that question than than I am. Uh, uh, Lehman Kung, I I believe uh, has some data on that from University of Delaware. My understanding is that that at three months you would be at at a safe spot, um, but I, I I hate to give an exact answer without without having that data fresh in my mind. But that 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 as I remember it, it would be a safe spot. All right. So we have a question that's come in about reproductive performance under hot summer conditions. And I just want to say that you can find a number of webinars on that specific topic on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to a different question. So how would I know how to adjust my expected milk composition throughout the year? Yeah. So in our, um, 2019 paper that we published in Journal of Dairy Science, we actually have a table in there that gives a, an adjustment factor. Uh, so depending on your region, it would tell you based on our database, um, how much to, to adjust across the year. Just that rough number, um, you know, if, if you're in the Northern half of, of the US, adjusting 0.2 units across the year in, in your goal, um, would get you pretty close, um, but but we have published those those adjustment factors. And so, does the type of light matter? I think we talked a little bit about this. Yeah. So, in in this is a kind of I I um, don't get into the engineering part very much, but this is kind of an interesting spot where, with all the technology as technology's changed, right? So now we have LED lights. And um, so we can run lighting both cheaper, it takes less power, and we can select wavelengths much more. So during the day, we would want to be selecting a blue light um, to, to, to get the biggest impact. And you know, again, in, in, remember in the 2000s, that was the big deal is going in and measuring your candlelights and and making sure you're getting enough light because lighting was very expensive to buy and run at that time. I'm not saying it's all cheap now, but it, it, there, there has been some major advances there. So we'd want more blue light during the day, um, um, less blue light at night. And, and again, the dim red light would be, would be our preference for at night. So wouldn't uh, the number of feeding times or feed push-ups help? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, there is a difference in the impact of delivering fresh feed versus pushing up feed. Uh, a little bit of this depends if that feed is not within reach. So I know some, some barns, if you're feeding once per day, that's a big pile of feed and, and the feed can be out of reach. So you definitely need to push up feed uh, and, and make sure feed is within reach. But pushing up feed is not as effective as delivering fresh feed. Um, Trevor DeVries, going all the way back to some of his PhD work at British Columbia, um, char did characterize that very well. And, and I really like uh, Trevor's recommendation, which is to push up feed until cows are not coming to you pushing up feed. So you, you trick them to begin with, but then you, you lose out on that. And then you have to use more feed deliveries to get cows up in, into eating. Now, I, I don't, I, I, I think you can go overboard on number of feed deliveries. I think you can get what you need with two feed deliveries if you're timing those to be at the right time. Um, I know people like delivering feed when cows are away at the parlor. To me, that's kind of wasting that, that, uh, 
bullet you have to modify feeding behavior. I like the idea of feeding, you know, two hours before the cows go to the parlor, making sure it's pushed up and there's fresh feed when they get back. But then you got some feed into them before they went to the parlor. They're not slug feeding quite as much when they return. So I'm going to do another plug here because we have a great webinar on optimizing feed intake by Dr. DeVries that you can find on our YouTube channel. Uh, so we had another question come in about how the impact of white LED lights can have an effect during the night if the resting space is outside the barn. Uh, yeah, it's, that's an interesting question. So if the cows are coming in to eat, they're getting exposed to that light. And it doesn't take very long light exposure to cause a problem. And to tell you the truth, this is why I have not done research experiments with, with lighting. Um, because so in the basic work with mouse, uh, mouse experiments, they, they actually have double doors that you go into a dark room and then you open the door to go into the mouse room because just opening the door and the light coming in from the hallway as you go into the room can be enough to, to reset some of these, these rhythms. Um, so, so that cow coming into the barn, um, she, when she's exposed to that light would, 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 be, would be a problem. My question would, there would be, do, do you have to have those lights on? And, um, you know, I, I, I haven't done that experiment, but it would be interesting to see if you just turn those lights off, how do the cows do? Can they still get around? And, and I know just comments from some other people, they, they didn't think the cows had, had any problem um, getting, getting around uh, in, in kind of finding their, their way, right? Uh, in that, that light, might have been more of our view of it than the cow's view. Perfect. Now, our last question today is, are there any feed additives that can help? Yeah, so um, not that I know of for this seasonal rhythm. Um, you're you're uh, um, trying to think, think through some of these other seas call them seasonal management problems. Um, there, there's probably things that can help in those. So thinking about when you have silage fermentation issues or silage quality issues um, and even heat stress and, and some of the stress that that, that causes. Uh, but I, I don't know of any feed additives that, that would directly impact this. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a great webinar. I'd like to invite everybody to join us on July 16th for our next webinar, which is Dairy Calf Welfare, Housing and Care for the Next Decade. So thank you very much, Kevin, for coming in and speaking with us. We have really appreciated this. Sounds great. Thank, thank you for having me. Right. Have a good day, everyone.